Let's get this show on the road. We are 1859. Okay. So we we do get we do get white again against Morad uh, the fourth. That's a pretty imposing name. We're going to play one e four. Uh, we did a brief excursion a couple of games ago, played the Jababa London, but now we are back to our main openings. And I think it's more exciting now because we're playing pretty high rated folks, and you know we're going to see if my opening recommendations actually hold up at a higher level. Of course, the main opening recommendation is the Alapen Sicilian, which we are going to play. And at this level, I would say 1700 plus, almost everybody has a line against the Alapen. They've studied the Alapen at one point or another. But typically what I found is that they might know, you know, three or four moves of theory. They might know the basic ideas, but that's what makes the Alapen so dangerous. It's not enough for Black to just know you know, the basics or the first couple of moves. The theory goes for a long time and black can get crushed even with prior knowledge uh, of certain variations. So, okay, uh, enough talk. D5, of course, is the main move. We've already faced it a couple of times in this speed run. We take on D5. Okay, and this is the second time that we're facing the move uh, knight to f6. What's hilarious is that, okay, those watching on YouTube, I don't know if my editor is gonna put that initial segment in the video, but uh, before I started this game, I got paired against an opponent that I had already played before, uh, and I aborted that game. That opponent had been facing me with black, and he had played the move knight f6. So you can find that game in the speed run. And after that game concluded, I took out the Alapin Bible, uh, the Kalifman book, and we actually checked what Kalifman's recommendation was against knight f6. So this is going to be, you know, opening improvement in action. You might remember that bishop b5 check was my choice in the first game that we faced this line. But I remember distinctly that Kalifman recommends the move queen to a4 check. So the move is queen a4 check, and we're going to play it. What on earth is the, the zen behind queen a4 check? Well, the idea of this move is exactly the same as the idea behind bishop b5 check. It's to force a piece to appear on d7. Why are we forcing a piece to appear on d7? Well, the main reason is to cut the contact between black's queen and the pawn on d5 to make this pawn harder to win back. Now, of course, queen d7 runs into bishop b5 and black loses on the spot. So the move bishop d7 is technically a developing move. So you might say, well, why are we helping black develop with tempo? But remember, not all developing moves are necessarily good. Just because a piece moves out of its initial square doesn't necessarily mean that that's a good thing. And here it's most definitely not a good thing. Where should the queen go back to? That's the first big question. Of course, we go back to b3 and three things happen. The first is that we're attacking b7. The second is that black cannot recapture on d5 precisely because the bishop intercepts the queen's connection with the pawn. And the third thing is that the knight on b8 no longer has a good developing square. It can come out to a6 potentially, but you can tell how awkward of a developing move that is. So the reason we don't play queen c4 is because we want to hit that tender pawn on b7. The second reason is that we want to reserve the c4 square for the bishop. Queen c4 would be kind of stepping on the bishop's toes. And c4 is a much more vulnerable square for the queen. It can be pretty easily attacked with a move like b5. Okay, queen b6. Our opponent might be aware uh, of the theory here. I'm pretty hazy on the theory at this point. I remembered queen a4, queen b3, but at this point, I'm basically on my own. So let's try to think logically and see if we can maintain an advantage. So first of all, I don't want to take on b6. I don't want to give black the open a file and pressure on the a2 pawn. You might be aware of many openings in which queens on b3 and b6 are standard in the London system. This is incredibly common. And typically, as hopefully you know, you're actually not supposed to be the one to release the tension because that opens up an A file now that can be used to pressure the queen side. So I would play, yeah, bishop c4 I think is kind of a no-brainer here because we develop the bishop, we reinforce the pawn, and we toss the ball right back into black's court. If our opponent takes on b3, remember that concrete considerations always take precedence over following general principles. So the general principle would seem to indicate that we should recapture with the pawn. But if you look very carefully, recapturing with the pawn would be a mistake because black has the move b7, b5, hitting our bishop. The bishop doesn't have b3 anymore. 
And so we will end up losing the pawn on d5 back. Uh, so in fact, if our opponent would have taken on b3, we would have recaptured uh, with the bishop and tried to maintain our extra pawn. Knight a6, I think, is a good move. What does our opponent want? Well, first of all, he's just developing the knight. But I think he's trying to swing this knight back to uh, c7 in order to put more pressure on the d5 pawn. And ideally, we don't want to give that pawn away without a serious fight. So let's consider the various methods at our disposal to keep this pawn alive or to attack something and distract Black's attention from the d5 pawn. So what comes to mind here? I actually have to think for a couple of moments here. This is not an easy position. I have one idea that's pretty straightforward, but I'm looking for something better. Of course, I've forgotten completely what Kalifman's recommendation is. I'm pretty sure this position did occur in our first video in which this line was played against me, but of course I've forgotten everything. Okay, so I can't find a clear way to stop knight c7. The idea of knight e2, knight c7, knight f4 came to my mind, but the problem is that the knight, knight can be chased away with the move g5. Although after g5, maybe the knight can swing back to d3 and put pressure on c. But this all seems very speculative. And if our knight lands on d3, then how are we going to get our bishop out? How are we going to get our other knight out? Nah, I don't want to get too greedy here. Instead, we're going to take a slightly different approach. We're going to say, okay, it's going to take black two moves to play knight c7 and knight takes d5. In those two moves, we are going to try to secure a different kind of positional advantage. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna trade in our material advantage for a positional advantage. What positional advantage can we acquire here? Where I see a way that we can acquire the bishop pair. We can acquire the bishop pair by going after the d7 bishop. How can we go after the d7 bishop? Well, first of all, we play knight f3. This is a move that you should probably play even if you don't know what your follow-up is going to be. Knight f3 is just, you know, a priori a good move because it develops the knight and prepares castling. But after knight c7, I think a critical moment arises. Now, first of all, what is black threatening after knight c7? It's not knight takes d5 because then we play bishop takes d5. After knight c7, black threatens to trade queens and only then to recapture the pawn. Just a little clarification that I wanted to make. But it's probably not a good idea for black to take the queen first, because in that case, we again play bishop takes b3. And if black plays knight c7 there, we can actually reinforce, we can reinforce the d5 pawn with a move c4. But I think it's important for black to actually go knight c7 here. Move order is always super crucial uh, in these complicated positions. Now, d6, a lot of you are very attracted by, but look at it more carefully. Black doesn't have to play e takes d6 and give up f7 with check. In response to d6, black takes on b3. And neither dc nor de come with check. So we're going to have to recapture the queen, and black just plays e takes d6. We've given black the pawn with interest. So what move have I been hinting at continuously? How do we go after the bishop pair? Well, the move should be pretty obvious to you once I point that out. Uh, we can play the move d4. Yeah, d4 comes to mind, but I don't really see what it accomplishes exactly. d4, black plays queen takes b3. Bishop takes b3. C takes d4. Okay, you trade on d4. Black takes on d5, and I feel like we have a completely equal endgame. I think more meat on the bone is yielded by the move knight e5. This is a challenging move because it goes after the bishop pair. You might say, well, is the bishop pair really that important in the endgame? Well, I will try to prove to you that it is. I think our possession of an uncontested light squared bishop is going to yield dividends in the end game, but I'm not entirely sure. So I will admit that I'm not positive that this is the right approach to the position, but it's pretty risk-free. I mean, we're essentially forcing a slightly better end game, and there are worse things in life than a slightly better end game. Okay, knight f7 is not even a threat if you think about it, because after king f7, you guys want d6 check. I see the temptation, but the knight from c7 can cover the check on e6. Remember when you give a discover check, uh, check whether the piece that you're attacking cannot itself block the check. That's just an item on the checklist you always have to go through. We give a discover check, let's say to a queen. Can the queen itself move away and block the check? You know? Okay, what should we take back with? Well, of course, the situation has changed, and we're, we've already agreed uh, to part ways with our d5 pawn. So the previous logic of taking back with a bishop is kind of null and void 
at this point, right? Because we're going to lose the pawn anyway, so we might as well garner as many advantages as, as we can before it's too late. So if, from that perspective, A takes B3 actually makes a lot of sense to open up the A file, uh, going down the, the, the logic that I described earlier. On the other hand, bishop takes b3 keeps our pawn structure intact, but I want to play with a little bit more spice, so let's take with a pawn. And this is, of course, very typical uh, across many, many different types of openings, and I'll give you a couple examples after the game. So if you're watching this on YouTube and you know, you're know you newer to chess and you hear me say, oh, this is typical in oh, these openings and you don't know what I'm talking about, don't feel, you know, don't feel bad. I'll usually try to educate you a little bit about some of the similarities after the game. So, of course, black can greatly diminish the pressure along the A file with a well-timed A6. But remember, it's not just the pressure on the A7 pawn that we have. It's also squares for the A1 rook. The move rook A1 to A5 can come at a very inconvenient moment for black. We can hit C5. And just square control is good in and of itself. The fact that the rook has all these squares restricts black's mobility in certain ways. I'm not saying that it's a game changer, but these small advantages, they accumulate. And when you hit this level, 1900, 2000, it's very hard to win right out of the opening. A lot of games aren't decided any longer by big tactical blunders. They're decided by an accumulation of smaller positional advantages that taken together allow you to outplay your opponent. So in this case, we have two distinct advantages. Right now we have an extra pawn, but we won't have that presumably after black's next move. So the first advantage is the bishop pair that we're going to have after we take on d7. And the second advantage is we have control over, better control over the a file. We need to gather more advantages, uh, but that'll come in due time. There is one small problem with the move that I just played. If this is in fact a problem, it might turn out after the game that bishop takes b3 was more advisable. I actually think this is what our opponent is contemplating currently. It's, it's not. These are all very minor details, but there, there might be a way for black to keep his two bishops. And that is the move bishop to f5, which some of you have suggested. In my naivete, I thought that it meets with d6, discover attack against the f7 pawn, but I didn't calculate far enough. Bishop f5, d6, e takes d6, knight e5 takes f7, who can tell me the move that I missed from a distance and why it's good? Yeah, Perturb is on fire. d6, d5. Now you might say, but don't we take the rook in the corner? And doesn't black only have one minor piece for the rook? That's true. But the knight on h8 is also going to get trapped. And white has a couple of extra pawns in that line as well. So I'm not totally sure how to evaluate that position. But it gets very complicated. And I don't want to give our opponent unnecessary tactical chances in an endgame where we're enjoying our life. Bishop f5 played. Okay, so let's deal with this new set of circumstances. Again, knight takes f7, king takes f7, d6 check doesn't work because of knight e6. So I will admit that I missed this move, and I think we've lost our advantage. That means we're playing an equal endgame. There are worse things in life than an equal endgame. Let's try to out outplay our opponent. Okay. So let me think here for just a moment, because there's many ways to, to play this position. We're running a little bit low on time. So the situation is, is, is very complex. I have an interesting idea. So I'm basically looking at this position saying, okay, well, we haven't completed our development. That's the biggest priority. What pieces have we not developed yet? Well, obviously we should castle at some point, but we should also consider developing our queen side. But we should be careful about how we do it, because if you play the move d3, the bishop is actually going to get trapped by the move b5. So I'm also looking at the knight on b1, and I'm asking myself, well, what can we offer for the knight? And I'm actually noticing the move knight to a3, which is a very interesting idea. That knight can head to b5 if you play the alipin consistently. This should be intuitive to you. Knight a3, knight b5 is a super typical maneuver across different sub variations of the alipin and it can be very problematic for black as i think it is here the move knight b5 is going to be pretty darn unpleasant for black yeah of course a6 a6 counters knight b5 but the knight can also drop back to c2 the knight on a3 actually has a lot of prospects it can go back toward the center through c2 to e3 and a6 does spend a tempo and what i want you to realize is that even if black plays a6 
the rook on a8 is defended by the knight on c7. But if that knight moves, for example, to take the pawn, we could still play knight b5. That's one of the benefits, the hidden benefits of having the open a file. So pr presumably if, if our opponent played a6, we would just castle short and try to force black to put his cards on the table. a6 played, we castle kingside, and we kind of sit tight. Now, I was, I'm a little bit, I was a little bit worried about the move b5. Um, I was a little bit worried about the move b5, bishop e2, followed by b4. So that's a little bit worrisome. Um, it's a little bit worrisome. So we'll see if our opponent expands on the queen side with b5 or, or, or takes, takes the pawn on d5. And if he takes on d5, then, of course, the big question is which knight will he take with? But there, there's a lot that more than meets the eye in this position. A lot of like hidden tactics here that hopefully I'll be able to explain in greater depth after the game. I will confess, though, I haven't played great so far. I'm pretty disappointed at my move a takes b3. Like bishop b3 would have been a lot better because it would have paved the way for the c-pawn to move up to c4 which would have forced Black's hand. It would have forced Black to take the pawn. Then we would have secured the bishop heir, and we would have been solidly better. But that's in the past now. Knight takes d5. Okay. So how do we proceed? We proceed. Now, of course, we can already play knight b5. The issue is that knight b5 does not create any threats, right? It, it looks pretty, but where is the knight actually going to go from b5? I don't see any further squares because c7 is guarded by black's knight. Um, so we need to find some way to sort of open up... It, well, we need to open up the dark squared bishop at some point. So d4 comes to mind. But that leads to an isolated queen pawn situation where black has control of the square in front of the pawn. Can we add a little bit of Tabasco sauce to this position? That's kind of what we need. We need to move that really mixes things up in some way. I have an idea. This is a risky move, but it's an interesting move. I'm noticing that the two knights are linked up, right? So anytime there's contact between one of your pieces and one of your opponent's pieces, you know the drill. You have to consider that from a tactical perspective. If hypothetically there was a way to chase away the knight on f6, that would be really good. That would even win a piece. When I start saying that, hopefully your eyes are kind of automatically drawn to the right side of the board, literally and, and figuratively, the move is g4, the move that I have in mind. Now, it's not that risky because it's an endgame and we're not too worried about the weakness of our king. We're forcing black to make a difficult decision here because g5 is a huge threat, as is g takes f5, so the bishop has to find a place to go. Let's see where our opponent drops back to. Yeah, I can play d3, by the way. d3 is now possible because, as we've already established, b5 runs into knight takes b5. But the additional drawback of playing d3 is that Black's Rook could move away from a8, and that would reinforce the threat of b5. On the Scoville unit, this is, you know, a little spicier than Tabasco. A little spicier than Tabasco. Now, we might be going the wrong direction here, and this might be a terrible move, but I really don't think it is. And I, I really cannot emphasize enough that I'm, I'm exaggerating when I say that it's a risky... It's really not all that risky, because the queens are off the board. So... I'm not anticipating getting checkmated here, really. I'm not. And that should be pretty clear to you, just because of the fact that black is also very undeveloped. So I don't see a way for black to whip up a sudden attack on our king. It's much more dangerous to play this move when the queens are on the board. Time is getting kind of low here. This has been a very, very complicated first 12 moves. And I don't anticipate things to get any less complex. Okay, so bishop e6, of course, is the correct move. What have we accomplished by forcing the bishop back to e6? Well, we've accomplished one main thing, which is that we've buried, we've buried the bishop on f8. We've bought ourselves a couple more tempi for the development of our pieces, and we have forced the black bishop off of f5. What was the bishop doing on f5? Well, it was controlling the c2 square. Why is that important? Well, because I mentioned when we played the move knight a3 that b5 isn't the only promising prospect for the knight. We can also drop the knight back to c2, and as lame as a retreating move may appear, the knight on c2 is actually a very well-placed piece in the elephant for two reasons. The first is that it can move toward the center with knight e3. The second is that it can prepare the pawn push d2, d4, 
And if we play d4 with a knight on c2, things start getting dicey for black in the center, especially with the king side as undeveloped as it is. Notice also that uh, that black is not threatening to take on g4. That still doesn't work. But we have to figure out the correct move order. Should we play the move g5? I don't think we should because that only helps black remove our active knight from the board. I think we should go knight c2. I think we should go knight c2. We're rerouting and we're preparing the move d4. And we're clearing the A file, so hopefully you're able to see that bishop to b5 check in some circumstances could be a pretty nasty move for black. Uh, Knight of Nart says, why not b... I don't really understand b4. C takes b4. I don't really see what that accomplishes. I mean, it kind of ruins the pawn structure. And the idea of pushing b5 seems a little bit too slow. Yeah, I have a feeling that this game might at least partially be decided on the clock because each game is taking us, each move is taking us like, you know, a minute. Okay. Oh, I forgot the black could do that. <laughs> I completely forgot the black could do that. All right. So what's happening here? I don't think it's that good for black, to be honest. I feel like the king and the queen side is actually pretty vulnerable and it could get attacked with a potential sacrifice on a six, even with the queens off the board, bishop takes a six could potentially be a pretty dangerous move um now it, it's important to establish that with his last move black is reinforced the threat of knight takes g4 why is it now a threat because the rook defends the knight uh so it's a threat so h3 comes to mind but h3 is too slow i really feel intuitively that every tempo matters in a position like this so really even without calculating i want to strike with d4 before black has a chance to complete his development so is there a way to defend this pawn with tempo? Well, there sure is. There's the straightforward move g5, attacking the knight. And on the next move, basically regardless of where black puts the knight, we're going to strike at the center with d4. And then things get really, really spicy. Entirely possible that objectively white is worse here, but I feel like practically with black's king side not yet developed, the situation becomes very difficult to handle with black. No, we're not going to pre-move. I mean, I, you, our opponent has thrown some crowbars at us, so I'm going to err on the side of caution here. I mean, why would white be worse here? Well, the main reason would be the pawn structure, which has been seriously damaged by our cavalier play. Make no mistake, I pointed out that g4, g5 is not particularly risky from a king safety perspective, but it is risky from a pawn structure perspective. I mean, you should see that it creates major square weaknesses on the king side. And the g5 pawn is itself now a weakness until it is supported by h4. It can also be used as a hook by black to try to open up the h file and activate the rook with a move like h6. You're probably familiar with this idea in the context of attacking. And of course, don't fall asleep on our queen side pawn structure, which is also very much subpar. So trades in general are going to favor black here. We're going to try to keep as many pieces on the board as possible. But... My worry is that this game might be decided on the clock, and I don't want that to be the case because this is actually a super, super interesting endgame thus far. But that's also part of realistic chess. Right? When you create complications right out of the opening, you force your opponent to take a ton of time, and that's just a legitimate thing that, that does actually happen. Knight d7, good move. So our opponent is targeting our most active piece, and unfortunately, we can't have our cake and eat it too either we get d4 and or we preserve our knight. It's not both. Now, we definitely should not play d4 here because black can then initiate the trade and take the teeth out of the pawn on d4, which shifts to e5. So, of course, we should trade knights first, and this is basically a no-brainer. Then we immediately push d4, really without thinking further. And this is starting to look pretty darn decent for white because we are attacking the c5 pawn. This is the benefit of playing against your opponent's lack of development. If black could play the move e6 here, he would be totally fine, but I don't see an easy way for black to do that. Bishop f5, I guess that is the easy way to do that. But is it an easy way to do that? I think that might have been a subtle tactical mistake. I think bishop to h3 followed by e6 might have been the way to do it. Okay, why is it a subtle tactical mistake? Well, here I think things get very concrete, and I have no... Listen, I have no good way of explaining how I just found what I found. Of course, throughout the game, one of the points of tension has been the knight on d5. You know that, right? That's kind of why we played the move g4 earlier. 
So at every point, I've been kind of briefly considering the captures, right? You're just following the rules and considering like the checks and the captures. And bishop takes d5 is a move that you should be considering even for a brief instant on every move, just like we should consider it here. Bishop takes d5, I think, works out beautifully. Because if black plays rook takes d5, guess what? Our knight lands on e3, and uh, we win the exchange because the rook has no squares along the fifth ring. So our opponent immediately accepts the inevitable and takes d2. But now we take f7, and that is a big, big, big pawn. That is a big pawn because we're now threatening to drop the bishop back to e6, which is why black doesn't have time to take on d4. Black also cannot play e5 here as cool of a move as that appears, because it doesn't actually stop bishop e6. Black has to burn a crucial tempo, either protecting the e6 square or moving either the rook or the king. And in all of those cases, we get we can use that tempo to solve the problem of our center. Yeah, so for example, I'm anticipating the move bishop c2 back to f5. That's like the, the simplest way to defend e6. That gives us a critical tempo, but we need to be very judicious about how we use that tempo because just starting to gobble up more pawns like d takes e5 i think would be a mistake here because it would finally allow black to open up his king side with e6 incidentally that also hits our bishop the bishop has to move black's bishop recaptures e5 and actually in that resulting position black has very serious compensation for the pawn because we have all of these weaknesses on the king side instead the sexy move as some people in the chat are saying is to play d5 and of course, the idea is, uh, there's only one idea. We're preventing e6. We're continuing to play against black's kingside pieces, making it as difficult as possible to develop them. Why are we preventing e6? Well, because we can just play pawn takes e6, or, or even bishop takes e6, and we win a second pawn. And you might say, well, okay, what about e6, pawn takes e6, a rook e7? Doesn't black win the e6 pawn back? And the answer is no, because we could bring our rook over to e1 at any moment. White should be technically winning here, but... Our opponent has played an excellent game, so we we have a lot of hard work remains ahead of us. Was rookie one instead inferior? Yeah, rookie one instead didn't do any. Well, rookie one instead, you're trying to control the e6 square. But notice that the move rookie one doesn't prevent black from playing e5. Also, you're blundering the d4 pawn, which is currently attacked twice. That was the secondary idea, which is that we were, black was threatening to take twice on d4. You might look at this and say, well, doesn't that open the C file? Maybe we could have sacrificed it and got bishop b3 at the end. But again, these are unnecessary complications that we avoid with the move d5. Very importantly, if black plays e5, we can take en passant and simultaneously defend the bishop. Would rook a5 have been good to ask, Jelly? That's a f I love the fact that you spotted that move. Unfortunately, by playing e6, black is also protecting the c5 pawn. So rook a5 would not have been effective here. But again, kudos for spotting that. Rook a5 is definitely a move that should be on your radar because it hits the c5 pawn. And on the previous move, it even pinned the pawn to the bishop. So it comes close to working. <laughs> Isn't Anpas on a hacking move? Could he be banned for cheating? So our opponent is down to below two minutes. And you know you can sense that the game is starting to slip away from him. But uh, hopefully he puts up a stern resistance. But the bishop hangs, right? When black plays e6, the bishop hangs. Okay, king d8. So does this move accomplish anything? I don't really think so. I don't see what it accomplishes. Does it reinforce the threat of e6? No, because we still play d takes e6. Now, what does, it, what does that tell us? It tells us that we are, have time to play a general improving move, right? A move that doesn't necessarily create a huge threat, but that in some way improves our position. Well, what can we do to improve our position? Well, there's one thing that's very obvious. There's low-hanging fruit, which is that our bishop is not out yet. Where should we put it? Well, there are two squares that seem appealing. D2 is too passive. There's F4 and there's E3. Both of these moves have their appeal. What I like about bishop to F4 is that it fully restricts black's rook. It covers uh, the rook's two escape squares, and it actually paralyzes black completely, which is crazy. If you look at bishop F4 carefully, the only way that black has of bringing out the dark squared bishop is to play the move g6. Who can tell me how bishop f4, easy question, how does it stop g6? How does it stop g6? Yeah, because then we can play bishop e5 and the rook is literally trapped because g8 is controlled by the other bishop. So 
the more I look at it, the more I like the look of bishop f4. Bishop e3 is also excellent. This was my initial intention because it attacks c5, and c5 cannot really be defended because b6 runs into rook takes a6. Guess what? This is what we were talking about at the start, which is that even though the rook quote-unquote bites on granite, the b7 pawn is often needed to defend its counterpart on c5. So we're actually putting tremendous amounts of queenside pressure. But I, this move is a freaking, this is a GM move. Bishop f4 is definitely a GM move because as tempting as it is to hit the pawn, it's even better to paralyze your opponent completely. Maybe bishop e3 is better. Maybe we're getting too fancy, but I can't pass up this opportunity. What's amazing is that if black tries to chip away at the edge with h6, we drive the pawn down to g6, and that makes things even worse. Then black is completely entombed. Completely entombed. I mean, black is already entombed. Black is already entombed. There's no moves. And look at this. Bishop g6 trying to trade the bishops. Whoop! We drop back to e6, and the rook is trapped. The other benefit of putting the bishop on f4. So all of you should be looking at this and understanding why black is totally paralyzed. It's Zugzwang. I mean, it's not totally Zugzwang because black can make a waiting move, and black can move the king back to c8. But it's as close as it comes to actual Zugzwang during a game. Bishop c2 is a good move. I think this is as good of a chance as it gets. And now we can continue trying to play healthy positional chess. Uh, bishop e6 is very tempting, I know. But bear with me for a second. After bishop e6, black takes on b3. You might say, well, that's an exchange. Yes, you win an exchange. But at the end of the line, we have a hard time defending the d5 pawn. Because that bishop on b3, it also guards the d1 square. So black will snag that pawn on d5 and actually have a pawn for the exchange. Not ideal. Not ideal. Let's try to think of an alternative. Something that eliminates black's counterplay entirely. Okay, so rook a5 does come to mind to hit c5. That's one possibility. Also possible is the very awkward looking move rook to a3. It looks awkward because we're using an entire rook to defend against a trivial threat, but it's really not a trivial threat. We do not want to give up this pawn. We need that the you know the big boys to do the heavy lifting here. What else is the rook going to do? Nothing. I don't see a single compelling reason we shouldn't play rook a3 here. Again, awkward looking move, but if you look one step further, we can follow up with rook to c1, so we're just going to have to bear with this for one move. And then the rook can move up to a5. Bishop e6 exactly is not going anywhere. The rook cannot be... Okay, our opponent is collapsing with e6 and trying to give up a second pawn to free up this rook, which is an understandable reaction, but it's, it's from the frying pan into the fire. So what should we take with? Well, let's think about that for a second. Pawn takes e6, I think, is more tempting for most people, but it has to be calculated because as a result, the bishop is going to be a little bit trapped on f7. So the positional move is just to take back with the bishop. That's the move which requires less calculation. And less calculation, given our time situation, is good. So let's take on e6 with the bishop. Okay, bishop d6. Our opponent sacks the exchange for activity. Not a bad move at all, by the way. And in a classical game, I would consider refraining from bishop takes d7, because black plays bishop takes f4, and, you know, the g5 pawn falls, and a rook is passive, so I wouldn't grab that immediately. Let's continue trying to play while eliminating any semblance of counterplay. I think we have a really cool move here. I think we have a really cool move here. So can we keep the tension between the two bishops? What do you know about situations where the bishops are staring at each other like this? Well, off oftentimes, you want to do what's called trading on your own terms. You should know this if you play the London system. Yeah, I like bishop g3. This is a really nice looking move. And if black takes, which way do we take? Well, you might say, well, I learned that I have to take toward the center. But this is an endgame. We have to think more concretely. Let's take with the f pawn to open up the f file for our rook. And we can now play h4 and solidify the g5 pawn. So this is no longer a weakness. What are the other problems that we should solve here? Well, I'm irritated by this darn bishop on c2. Let's get it the hell out of there. Should we go rook c1? Well, no. Then why did we take on... Uh, g3 with the f pawn. Let's play rook f2, keeping the rook on the f file and chasing the bishop away. Then we can drag this other rook around and it can finally rejoin society. It's done its job on, 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 on a3. Okay. And we definitely need to stay very precise here. This is not over. We're up two pawns, but 
Our opponent is defending very resiliently, and we're low on time. There's a really cool trick. If our opponent plays bishop to d1, trying to stay tied down to the b3 pawn, we have a super cool tactic there that I think wins the game. Hopefully we get a chance to experience it. No, bishop g6. Okay. So next priority, right? When you're in time pressure, it's important to keep your priorities in mind and, and sort of work on them very directly. Next priority is for us to improve the placement of our rook. How do we do that? We can lift it up through a4 to f4. I think that is the clinical approach. We could also, of course, I played rook a1. It doesn't really matter. But I think this is even better because here the rook has even access to like h4. Like if black plays h6, we can play maybe even rook h4. Doesn't matter. This, these are minor details. We're in time pressure. As long as we get the big picture right, we'll be fine. Okay, eight seconds for our opponent. He might flag. King e7. Okay, so now let's complete our maneuver with rook a to f4, doubling up on the open file. This is logical. And we have two approaches, I think, to continue converting this advantage. We can, of course, at some point, play the move c4 to solidify the d5 pawn, but we don't need to rush with this move. Why not? Because the d5 pawn is very safely protected by the bishop. On what other sides of the board can we continue expanding and continue making improvements? Well, you probably noticed the move rook f8, which forces the rook trade. That's okay, but we can play rook f8 whenever we want to. I'm also looking at the king side. What do we have on the king side? We have a pawn majority. Well, let's push our pawn majority and try to run g4 and h5 up the board in order either to create a passed pawn in the event that black plays h6 or to push black off the board entirely because the bishop on g6 is going to be caught on the crossfire. Bishop e8. Okay, I think rook f8, it's a perfect time to play rook f8 perhaps. Hmm, let me think. No, let's start with g4. Let's, let's be consecutive, right? Let's, let's follow up with g4. Grabbing more space on the king side, depriving the bishop of more escape squares. And we're just pushing black and pushing black off the board. We're making small, gradual, improving moves. I think now's the perfect time to play rook f8. Why? Well, because it is. I think rook f8 is a good opportunity to simplify the game. We're in time pressure, so this makes it easier for us to play. And it applies more pressure on the bishop. Bishop g6, okay. Wow, opponent defending very, very well, I have to say. This is impressive. Okay, time for a little GM magic here. Let's deliver a check on d8 to dislodge the king from its blockading post. Let's see where the king goes. It's hard to say. I mean, our next move depends on where the king goes. And obviously, if black plays king c7, which I'm anticipating, there's also king e5. Two seconds for our opponent. He's going to... Okay, king e5. Now I have to calculate. Because I see a really beautiful note. It doesn't work. Okay. E5 is very strong, actually. I didn't quite anticipate that. Okay, I have to think. Okay, bishop h5. Forcing the bishop out. Bishop c2. Okay, now we're going to go bishop to g8, which is a weird move. But it's actually a pretty normal move because we're preparing to push the d-pawn forward. And we could not have done that immediately because, well, because the bishop on e6 would have hung. Now we can push d6. And what do you notice about the move d6? Well, what you notice is that the rook is literally trapped. That's also why I played bishop g8. The rook is now trapped and the game is over. The game is over because the rook has no squares. e6 is covered, f7 covered, e8 covered, d7, c7 both covered. Opponent resigns. Major props on a super resilient defense. I mean, if he brought us down to the last seconds. To those who freak out about the clock, I am aware of the clock at all times. You know, it's almost like I hate turbulence, but you know it's not dangerous because, you know, the pilots are in control. So I'm not going to let us lose on time, uh, barring an internet problem. So what you should understand is that, you know, 20 seconds is a lot of time. And if things get down to a time scramble, I will make a move eventually nor am i doing this for show I'm, I'm trying to fit in as much explanation as possible to clue you in on why i do what i do even when i'm in time pressure so sometimes i maybe you would in your eyes needlessly drop down to you know five seconds ten seconds but i want to keep everybody involved in the process the lesson is don't worry about it <laughs> okay so first things first this is an opening themed speedrun so we need to get our Alpin bible out and see what on earth i did wrong because we definitely should have gotten a bigger advantage than we got and i'll take this brief opportunity to thank everybody who subscribes to the youtube 
if you enjoy the content, you know, and you want to help me keep getting it out regularly, a, a, a sub really, really helps. The goal is 500k by December, which is probably unachievable, but um, every every sub counts. So thank you to everybody who supports. All right, let's get the Alapin Bible out. To those who need a refresher on the book, this is called Squeezing the Sicilian by Alexander Kolofman and Sergei Solovyov, which is, I think, one of the best new books on the Alapin. There are quite a few books on the Alapin, but this one is one of my favorites. So Queen A4 check is correct. You might remember that in our first game, we played Bishop B5 check. There followed Knight BD7, which is the best move. Then we played... How did that how did that game go? I think we played d4. Our opponent played a6. We dropped the bishop back to e2. Our opponent played. I want to say now our opponent recaptured the pawn. We played knight f3, or we I think we played c4, knight f6, and d5. This is how the game went. And does anybody remember how black is supposed to equalize in this position? If this is actually the reason why. Queen a4 check is a superior move to bishop b5 check. This line is very theoretical. It's very, it's well known. And Yazazi with five subs as well. Jeez, Louise. Yes, it's b5 to play this Benko Gambit style. This is actually how our game continued. C takes b5. And here our opponent, I think, might have made a mistake. The correct move is knight to b6. And black is going to win back the d5 pawn. And here black equalizes. White is not better here. I checked this with a high level engine. This is not the way to go. So queen a4 check is the more testing approach. So our opponent played bishop d7, which is one of the moves that they give. Bishop d7, queen b3 is correct. Queen b6 is correct. If instead black plays queen c7, then simply bishop c4. And this check is harmless in view of knight e2. Yeah, this is dumb. Now queen b6 is obligatory. Bishop c4 is correct. Knight a6 is correct. So we're following Califan's line. Knight f3, knight c7. And here they say, aha, uh -huh. so their main recommendation is d4, but they also give knight e5 as an interesting alternative. And I was right. After queen takes b3, we committed a serious inaccuracy by playing pawn takes b3. And I fell victim to exactly the same thing I warned people about, which is over-reliance on kind of general principles. I allowed myself to be guided by the general principle of opening up the a file. This is a good opportunity for me to show you some of the openings in which queen b3 queen b6 is standard mostly this happens in a d4 based opening so in the london system you get this very often uh, so for instance one of the main lines of the london goes bishop f4 knight f6 e3 so e6 this can happen in various move orders but the bottom line is uh, c5 c3 knight c6 knight bd2 so here for example queen b6 is a very standard very standard way to play, and, and white responds oftentimes with queen b3, and you have this exact standoff where, you know, black doesn't want to be the one to take on b3, and as you can confirm with the engine, white is supposed to take here, not with the knight, but with the pawn, and here white holds a serious advantage. Also in the Slav, in the Slav, as some of you are indicating, you also get a lot of queen b3, queen b6s. So what are, what are some variations of the Slav in which you get queen b3, queen b6? Let me think for a second. Well, in the Chebanenko Slav, the Chebanenko Slav being this move a6, you do often see white being the one to play queen b3. In the g3 Slav, you get queen b3, queen b6. So if white plays g3, this is actually what I play. You do see queen b3, queen b6 occasionally played in this line. You also see it in like this version of the g3 Slav. If black plays bishop f5 here, I think one of the main lines goes queen b3, and black gets the queen out to b6. And it's the same drill, where normally you'll see these queens staring at each other for a while. White's best move here, according to opening explorer, is either c5, trying to force black to be the one to take on b3, or dropping the queen back to c7. And now the bishop can come out with tempo, and uh, the line goes on. So, okay, you get the point. The point is the standoff of the queens on b3 and b6 is very standard, and the main characteristic of that standoff is that neither side typically wants to be the one to capture the opposing side's queen, even though it slightly damages the pawn structure because the pawn structure is subservient to peace placement and peace activity and control of squares. Okay, so bishop c4, knight a6, knight f3, knight c7, knight e5. Uh, their main move, by the way, is d4. They claim that d4 also gives an advantage, and they give the following lines. Queen takes b3. 
now you play pawn takes b3. Interesting. So here you take back with a pawn. Cd4, knight d4. It is also possible for white to choose here d6, creating an isolated pawn in his opponent's position. This is a desperado sack because you're going to lose the pawn anyway, so you want to ruin black's pawn structure while you're at it, and you get a slight advantage in the endgame. Bishop b2, bishop c5, bishop b3, knight g4, bishop takes, bishop takes, f3, bishop back, king up, and they give plus equals, which seems reasonable. I think white is slightly better here. So this is one possibility. Or instead of d6, you can play the no frills move, knight takes d5 uh, by black. And here they claim that white has a small but stable advantage in Hamrakulov, Guerrero, Arroyo, Spain, 2008, some game. Black has regained his sacrificed pawn, but is still too far from reaching complete equality. Now, one piece of advice if you're using opening books or you're using a chessable course, yes, you have to learn the moves that are, that are given in the book or in the course, but it's always a good idea to spend you know, a couple of minutes analyzing the position on which the author stops, right? So here, Kalifman stops his analysis and says that white is better. So it's always a good idea to really feel like you understand the resulting middle games. And one way to do that is just to kind of open, open-ended analysis with the engine, just make some moves, get a sense for how you want to develop your pieces and get a sense for why your position is good. Why is white better here? It's, it's not immediately obvious why white is better here, but the engine confirms that he is. So let's say black plays e6. I think there's a couple of factors that work in white's favor. Of course, there's the A file, which we've talked about. There's the nice placement of white's pieces in the center. And here the engine gives the move B4. Why, why play B4? Who can tell me a specific reason other than, okay, grabbing space, obviously, but what's the more concrete reason to play B4? It's prophylactic. What are we preventing? We're preventing Black's bishop from developing to c5. Why is it dangerous for Black's bishop to develop to c5? Because we want to keep our knight on d4. And the absolute last thing that we want, although the engine here does give knight to f3, the last thing we want is this transformation where Black has a massive blockading knight. So I really like the look of b4. So let's say Black plays bishop b7. Where is this knight going to go? Well, the engine gives knight d2 castles and now knight 2 to f3. And I think it's becoming clear why white is better here. White just has a big space advantage. The knight's coming into e5. Let's say black plays a6. Now you can bring the bishop out to g5, knight e5, rook e1. White has a bunch of ways to improve his position, and this just seems very, very pleasant. Very pleasant uh, for white. So I like that recommendation. In the next game, we will play d4. But instead, in this game, we played knight e5. And again, the best move here was to take back with the bishop. What's the difference? Well, if black plays bishop f5 here, as I've already explained, at this point, we have the move c4. And at a higher level of opening analysis, you have to treat things very, very concretely. You might look at this and say, well, wait a second. If c4 is good here, why can't we just play c4 here? Isn't this the same thing? Well, it's not the same thing because the queens are still on the board in this position. Who can remind me of Black's best move in this position? And if you're watching on YouTube, you should pause the video, kind of refresh your memory on that. Yes, it's e6, trading off the pawns, and hopefully you'll remember that black has full compensation for the sacrificed pawn in the form of massive control over the d4 square. And I've talked about this at length in other videos. Comparing and contrasting is a great way to build up your opening understanding. So take that instance of c4 and compare it to this instance of c4. What's the difference? Well, if black plays e6, white is actually essentially winning on the spot, so here the difference is that black is just unable to remove this pawn wedge. There is a check on a4. This is devastating because king e7 runs into the beautiful d6, deflection, and then you win the rook. Of course, black has the move b5 here, but after cb, white is threatening b6. This is losing. Black is getting destroyed here. Of course, e6 is impossible, but if black doesn't play e6, well, what is black going to do? Bishop a4 is a huge threat. Black cannot castle because f7 is lost the engine gives knight d7, but now white just trades, and uh, white can develop d3, knight c3, whatever, knight c3, e6, and white doesn't have to take on e6. This would give black control over the d4 square, much like in the other instance, but here white could just ignore and castle. And if black takes, then, well, we could flick in the move rookie one check and force the king out of the way or the bishop to e7 and just look at this position. This is disaster. d6 is coming d3 bishop f4 and black is you know out of breath here 
So again, everything in the opening is concrete. A move that is bad in one position could be good in another. And the higher rated you are, the more you have to appreciate this nuance. The lower rated you are, the more you can get away with just sort of memorizing a couple of opening lines, a couple of principles, and following those principles. But not to get too bogged down, if, if we had taken back with the bishop, our opponent would have taken on d5 with the knight. And my intention here was to take on d7 and play the move d3. And I think white is solidly better here because we have the bishop pair. And we have very clear prospects for our other minor pieces on the queen side. For example, knight d2, knight f3 is a great maneuver to contest the key central squares. And if black overextends himself with e5, we can use that pawn as a target and put a rook on e1, bishop b3 to a4 check uh, can be a very problematic move sometimes. Like if black plays rook e8, that is already a blunder. So here you can see a clear example of like the bishop pair being a really good thing. Okay, so a takes b3 is a mistake. Why is it a mistake? So once again, it's because now this bishop is stuck in the netherworld. And what I wouldn't give to be able to put the pawn on top of the bishop. I saw bishop f5, but falsely believed that d6 refutes the line. E d6, knight f7, and this looks great for white. But as you guys correctly pointed out, d5 is what I missed from a distance. This is an interference move. If you move the bishop, you lose the knight. If you take the rook, you're going to lose the bishop. And subsequently, you're also going to lose the knight. There's this classic maneuver, g6, bishop, g7, and the knight is lost. But actually, this is a very instructive moment. Who can tell me black's best move in this position? Who can tell me black's best move in this position? It's not g6. Because remember, the knight isn't going anywhere. It, it can't be evacuated by any other pieces. So you should take this opportunity to make it as difficult as to make life as difficult as possible for white. What does it mean to make life difficult here? Well, it means to make development difficult. Well, what does it mean to make development difficult? Well, what development is white intending? Well, primarily the, the development of this bishop and the development of this knight. For both to happen, white needs to push the d4, the pawn up to d4. So we put the bishop on top of the pawn, right? We just sit on white. We also prevent castling. Look at how much stuff this bishop accomplishes alone. White is close to being borderline lost here. Like, white has to figure out a way to get around the bishop with something like f3. But now black can calmly develop his other bishop and then just walk the king over to g8 and win back the knight. And the bishop is unassailable. Like, if you move the rook, then you also lose this pawn. And if you try to trap the bishop, then the other knight comes in and white just doesn't have the machinery to keep everything uh, in order here. So this is a classic type of technique where knights and bishops on the d6 square are unbelievably strong, if, especially if there is a piece like on c1 or on c8 whose development uh, you are blocking. I, I won a couple of nice games using this technique. Uh, one of them was against a GM uh, who really underestimated the effect of and the effectiveness of this particular type of development. So here it is. This is a game that I played in 2013 against Ukrainian GM Andrei Vovk. Okay, this will have to do. And this was a Rosalie Mississon. So completely different opening. But he plays this very dubious line with, with E5. And what immediately jumps out at you about the move E5? Well, it's the fact that it weakens the D6 square. And you might say, well, Black is going to play pawn D6 and fill that square with a pawn. But he doesn't do that. I played knight A3, played knight C4. He still doesn't play D6. I played d4 to blast open the center, sacrificing a pawn. He accepts the sacrifice. Queen f3. Castles. And already white is like borderline winning here with bishop f4 and knight d6. And you can see the similarity. Black simply is playing without a queen side. Even if black plays b6, the knight controls the bishop's only developing square. So I won the game and I could spend a while, you know, analyzing the game, but but the entire game, Black plays without his queen side. He tries to wiggle his way out of it, but he fails. And ultimately, I transformed the queen side pressure into a king side attack. The knight jumps back to f5 at the right at the right time. Notice that White is Black is still playing without all these pieces. What's the idea? If g f5, bishop h6 leads to checkmate because f6 is impossible. The pawn is pinned, so the queen has to move. I eliminate 
the Theon Kettoed Bishop, and then I take this pawn. Black is riddled. Black's position is riddled with weaknesses. Um, knight takes e5 is a tactical attempt, but I just checkmated him. Bishop f6 is a nice final flourish. And I drove his king out, and then I, I checkmated him. So the takeaway, again, is the power of that knight on d6. The other game that I had in mind, just a moment, the other game that I remembered on this topic was a much older game, and I think this one is a bit less uh, eye-popping, but you still will hopefully understand the, the, the uh, similarity. Okay, so here it is. This is a really old game. This is right before the World Youth Chess Championship in 2012. Completely different opening, but again, he goes e5. He goes knight e7. So you can see where this is going. And he allows the move knight d6, which is actually really, really bad. And he never recovers from the fact that he gives up his light squared bishop. So here, it's not that I'm sitting on d6. It's that I'm using it as a jumping off point to, uh, to eliminate the bishop. But without the light squared bishop, his light squares are horribly weak, as is the d6 square. And ultimately, he pays the, the price for that, the price for lacking a light squared bishop, because I'm operating entirely on the light squares in this game. All Everything on the light squares. Queen h5, bishop f5, and the game is won entirely on the light squares. Um, there was a similar famous game between Petrosian and Pachman, where Petrosian did something something similar. Anyway, not to belabor the point, you get it. Uh, just remember the power of putting something on d3 or on d6 uh, when there is an entire queen side that's undeveloped. Um, okay, so where were we? So all of this was in service of explaining why d6 is a bad move here. Knight f7, I remind you, if you invert the move order, it's even worse because black can save uh, the piece with knight e6. Um, so instead, I kind of accepted the inevitable and decided to get the knight out to a3, which I think is quite a good move. And I think our opponent responded very accurately with a6. This is a very high level move. A lot of people would have automatically taken on d5. And here we would have probably still played g4, by the way. But if black would have taken with the other knight, here I would have played knight to b5. And this is very problematic for black. This is very problematic for black because black is under a lot of strain in the center and black is under a lot of strain on the king side. And if black plays e6, then I think we can get away with uh, snagging this pawn on a7. The knight can evacuate back through b5. So yeah, knight f takes d5, we would have played knight b5. Of course, taking is uh, suicidal because knight f7 is coming next. So a6 was a very patient prophylactic move, realizing that this pawn isn't actually going anywhere. Okay, so we castled. Black plays knight c takes d5. And now I'm actually really, really happy with the move g4. This spices up the position. I remind you there are a couple of ideas of this move. First, how do you find a move like this? Well, okay, I can't lead you by the hand and pretend like every one of these moves is easy to find with some sort of algorithm. But as I've pointed out, anytime you have two knights that are defending each other and you're making contact with one of the knights, you should already be looking for ways to chase the other knight away with a pawn, right? And if I phrase it like that, then g4 should become pretty obvious. You should also understand that this knight is kind of overloaded. It, it has a clear responsibility, so it's not really controlling any of the squares on, uh, on, on the king side. I could probably even find you some games where... Uh, where white orchestrated this exact maneuver, this exact maneuver, uh, to win to win a piece. I'll run a little search while I'm talking about this position. And let's see what I can find. So this is not a well-known game, a Bulgarian women's tournament. It looks like a pretty straightforward end game, but you can see the similarity. There's a bishop on c4, there's a knight on d5. Guess what? White plays here. Guess what white plays here? Well, white plays the move g4. Now, black makes a mistake. Black makes a very instructive mistake. The best move, I think, would have been to drop back to e6, much like our opponent did in the game. But black, the, the rook is defending the knight. The knight is defending the knight. I'm not worried about white playing g5 because I can just move my knight away. Big deal. 
Big deal. The Rook's defending the Knight. What did Black miss? What very pretty sequence did Black miss? Very nice bouncing across. You should notice that Black is a weak back rank. So White takes on d5 anyway, and Rook takes a 7, wins a big pawn, and gets the Rook to a very active square. And then White went around and won a second pawn on b6. And can mango for the prep. So just one example of this uh, type of idea in, in the wild. Um, and combine that with a uh, very perceptive tactical vision, and you get really, really nice sequences. And White won the game. Okay, so we go back to the speedrun game. Yeah, so g4, right? This is not a particularly uncommon type of idea. Here we force black to play bishop e6 because bishop g6 would have simply lost a piece to g5. And I remind you, what is the benefit of forcing this bishop onto e6? Well, there's a couple. The entire game, Black struggled to bring the dark squared bishop out. This was where it started because we're preventing Black from playing e6. But the main idea is that we open up new prospects for our knight. The knight drops back to c2, preparing the central expansion with d4. When we have a development advantage or you have more active pieces, you want to open up the center. That helps you, you know, exploit that. And that's exactly what we're doing with the move knight c2. Okay, once, Rick, once Castles happens, which I missed, by the way, we have to reassess the situation and realize that knight takes g4 is a threat, so we took care of that by playing g5, forcing the knight back. A couple of questions. K Sandwich asks, is knight b5 possible instead of knight c2? So I talked about this during the game. I will ask you, K Sandwich, what is the threat that you pose with the move knight b5? What's your next move going to be? What's your next move going to be? Right? The problem is you're not threatening, and I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I'm trying to help you develop a method of testing whether these moves are actually good. The threat is non-existent because C7 is defended. I can also move my rook back, and this is the main reason that you don't want to play knight b5. Here, I reinforce the threat of taking the knight, so the knight just has to ignominiously drop back to a3. I guess my point isn't very good because white actually does have a threat. White's threat, I guess, is to play g5, and then play bishop takes d5, and then deliver a fork on c7. But it's way too cumbersome, and black has time to move the rook away. Does that make sense? Now the knight is attacked, and you have to move the knight back. But the way that I'm able to see that is, is by noticing that knight c7 isn't actually a threat here. Okay, we've got a couple of other questions. What's the eval after g4? It's about so it's an edge for white. It's about 0. 0.7 or 0. 0.8. Uh, Shabazz, bishop takes g4. We play knight takes g4, and... The knight on d5 is lost in the end. Okay, so on we go. Bishop e6, knight c2, castles with g5. Knight is forced back. We trade, and we play d4. And I will admit that there was one uh, very powerful defensive resource that I missed. I think at a grandmaster level, not even at a GM level, at like a high level, bishop f5 is the decisive mistake. After bishop takes d5, black is losing. Black is objectively lost. I just confirmed this with the engine. Who can remind me of a better way to do the same thing? Black's concept is the correct one, which is this bishop has to be developed at all costs. So you might say, well, then let's go g6. But hey, we're attacking the c5 pawn. And this actually isn't just a pawn. White can now use this pawn as a battering ram and shatter Black's king position. This is a disaster. So you need to figure out some way to get this pawn to e6. Bishop f5 was the right call. Bishop h3 would have been the right execution because it hits the rook. The rook has to move, and now black can play e6. But I don't actually think that this solves all of black's problems, and I just confirmed that with the engine. How should white proceed in this position? There is a very concrete approach that gives white a big queenside attack. If you're watching on YouTube, I would recommend that you pause and try to puzzle out this, this sequence. It's not easy. It's definitely not easy. So it's not bishop takes d5 and c4. That's an interesting proposal. But again, what do you accomplish by playing c4? I just dropped my rook back, and you've given up a very important piece, your light squared bishop. Now your light squares are going to be super weak. Aesthetic gotta, you deserve a sub. d takes c5, bishop c5, and suddenly you start pushing the b pawn. Now why on earth would you do that? Well, again, that rook on a1 has tremendous power in this game. Let's say the bishop moves back somewhere. White plays b5. And hopefully you can see the trouble that black is now in. Because if a takes b5, 
Rook A8 check wins the Rook in the corner. In fact, even better would be to first to first take on D5 and then play Rook A8 and Rook takes H8, winning an entire Rook. So I call this potential energy, right? Kinetic versus potential energy in, in pieces is something I've talked about in previous speedruns where the Rook on A1 has a lot of potential energy. It doesn't have any current energy because it's just biting on granite. But the moment the A file opens up, that Rook is going to be the game-winning piece. And appreciating pieces like this Rook can be very hard because you might be looking at it only in the short term. But the moment Black Castled Queenside, you know, I pointed out during the game that the King isn't actually that safe here. And one of the reasons why is that if the A file opens, Rook A8 is going to be devastating in many, many types of situations. So... Okay, so bishop h3, rook e1, e6, dc, bishop c5, b4, bishop b6 is maybe a better move. We still play b5, and if black tries to keep the a file plugged, who can tell me white's follow-up move? This is really pretty. White to play here. And it's the same theme again, this rook. And it's the power of having doubled pawns, which can be a good thing. b4, the other pawn comes in. All right, black simply cannot keep this pawn alive. Uh, knight b4 is interesting, but it doesn't really threaten anything. Again, it's the same problem because black defends the knight on d5 sufficient times. Yeah, b4. And you might say, oh, but aren't we blundering c3? But, well, we're giving up c3, but we're recapturing a5. And then we're going to push a6, and this is a monster past pawn, and black's king is wide open, and our king is completely safe. Uh, so hopefully that makes a certain degree of sense. So I already think that black is in trouble here, but bishop h3 might have afforded more practical chances. Bishop f5, bishop d5 is just game over. Paul Cryer asks, what about knight e3 instead of d takes c5 to trade off one of black's only good pieces? Great question. Uh, so you're proposing after bishop h3, rook e1, e6 to play knight e3. I think it's a reasonable move. But, okay, black can drop the knight back to b6. What have you really accomplished by chasing black's knight out of the center? It's not all that much. Also, you're experiencing some logistical problems because if you move your bishop, then I, well, then I can, I can take on d4 and I can get my bishop out and black seizes the initiative. So it's just that dc and b4 is much, much uh, more effective here. So here we play bishop takes d5. And again, the point is that this, this, this loses an exchange. For black because we're hitting both of these pieces and the rook can't keep the bishop protected and bishop h3 doesn't work obviously because at the end of the line you recapture the bishop and white is up a piece okay so our opponent chose the lesser evil by giving up f7 but it's not just any pawn that black loses it's a crucial pawn because now black is permanently devoid of the possibility of pushing the e-pawn so his king side is going to remain forever paralyzed as it basically did in the game I think really the game-winning move, though, was d5. This is the key follow-up, because I think a lot of people would take automatically, think, oh, I'm winning a second pawn, and this would allow black to get his pieces out. And I cannot emphasize enough that in a position like this, yes, white is probably better, but not by much, because suddenly black's pieces are super well-placed, and white's pieces are all over the place. And maybe we can play a move like bishop e3, but now black will trade, and get the rook into the second rank, and, you know, black acquires significant compensation for the pawn. So here, prophylactic thinking is uh, reign supreme, where you first and foremost have to ask yourself, what is my opponent's next move? And if you phrase it that way, well, it's pretty obvious, right? The king side is undeveloped. Black wants to play e6, or maybe even e5. Bishop f4 would incidentally walk into e5, and black wins a piece. The moment you realize that, the move d5 should be evident to you because e5 runs into en passant. You're just preventing black's only way of getting his pieces out. Perfect game to illustrate this concept, an old old game of mine. And I think it, it nicely illustrates the power of, of prophylactic thinking, as it's called. Thinking in terms of what your opponent wants and how to prevent it. Uh, this was one of the first games where I kind of did that successfully. So this position is where we, we're going to start looking. Uh, this was uh, super K through four uh, nationals in, in Houston, 2005. So in this position, I decided to sacrifice a piece. 
Um, I played the obvious move, rook takes a6. Why is this a peace sacrifice? Well, black plays c5. This is what my opponent was relying on, and the knight can't move because you lose the queen. Now queen a1, getting the queen into the attack, hook, uh, hooking up the queen and the rook. C takes d4, and in this position, I found a move that I was really, really proud of. So just by me saying that, you should know that it's not bishop takes d4. Why did I reject just recapturing? Well, what's the big worry here? The big worry for me was that black's king was going to escape into the center, or worse yet, onto the queen side, onto the king side. So there's the move rook a check, which I know all of you guys are looking at, but this actually helps black do what he wants to do anyway. This looks incredibly tempting, but it just forces the king to a spot that it wants to go anyway, thinking prophylactically yields a super strong move that essentially keeps Black's king imprisoned on the queen side. Uh, this is the queen side. I know it sounds weird, but that allows white to surround the king with the remaining pieces. Rook to a7, the quiet move. Now, of course, it's reliant on some tactics. DE, queen a6 check, queen b6 check, and queen c7 is an easy mate. Uh, but black brought the queen back. Now I can calmly take on d4. The king is stuck. It's under lock and key. And black can do nothing about this rook. Rook d7, there is a check on a8. Familiar tactic, by the way, right? Again, this rook a8 winning the other rook. After knight f6, I brought my other rook into the attack. And after knight d5, I found a really pretty winning sequence. Rook drops back to a6, forcing the queen to the 7th rank. Now it's time for a check. And the rook drops back to a7, again, pinning the queen and winning the queen. So anyways, prophylactic thinking, even in tactical position. What does my opponent want? How do I prevent it? How do I make it as hard as possible for my opponent to accomplish his aims, both general and specific? And the key takeaway is that this applies not just to like actual threats, like, oh, my piece is hanging, let's move it, but to conceptual ideas as well. E6 is a threat even though it doesn't win anything because it improves your opponent's position tremendously. And that's why D5 is so powerful. Okay, so King D8 and again, Bishop F4. Really like this move. What does our opponent want? He probably wants G6. Let's prevent it by pre pre preparing Bishop E5 in response, which would win the rook. Black is paralyzed. H6, G6. If black plays B6, then black loses the A6 pawn. This is technically a fork but this is technically a checkmate. Another benefit of putting the bishop on f4, it blocks the king's escape to the seventh rank. But it's a GM move, but I think everybody should find it. You should at least understand the logic behind it, and you should remember that e5 runs into en passant. This is an important tactical detail. Otherwise, you lose a piece. Black is in Zugzwang. Bishop c2, and now we calmly play an awkward-looking move, but we just eliminate all of Black's counterplay. So again, why didn't we play bishop e6? Because I didn't want to give Black a chance to sack the exchange and win the pawn on d5. And once the d5 pawn is won, Black will finally be able to bring his king side out. Definitely didn't want to allow that, so there's no hurry. Black is paralyzed. That's the power of keeping your opponent paralyzed. You have all the time in the world to do whatever it is you want to do. Okay, e6 is... Desperation, I think black is dead lost anyway. How would I play with black here? I would probably play bishop e4, but then white can just go c4. I would just resign. <laughs> this is game over. K Sandwich asks, what if black had played g6 here? Yes, this would have been the best move. Agreed. g6 here was black's last chance to develop his bishop, but I still think we would have played bishop f4. And here we have a move that I mentioned during the game I think it wins a third pawn in this position. Who can spot this devastating move? This is a move that should be on your radar. It should be on your radar. Rook a5. Very nice. Now, why is this move good here? Because black doesn't have b6, because then black loses a6, and we double on the a file and win. Black has no way to defend c7. This bishop on f4 is preventing black from playing rook c7. So black's going to lose a third pawn, and obviously, the, well, a second pawn rather, but once c5 is lost, the king is driven into the center and the other bishop can come back. This is lost. So that's the answer. No, uh, one more thing. Note that after rook f8 takes here, we have bishop e6. Very important tactical detail that in this position, the rook on uh, d7 is hanging. Otherwise, we would lose our bishop. Okay, so that's important. And after rook d3, we have a check. 
And now we can play bishop b6, and rook c8 is unstoppable checkmate. Okay. So, what did we have in the game? Well, we had e6, the, uh, bishop e6, bishop d6, bishop g3. I really like this move because it trades on our own terms, and we open up the f file. Same concept as the queen standoff on b3 and b6. Again, if you're a London player, this should be second nature to you, this bishop g3 kind of move. What do I mean by that if you're not a London player? Well... Again, in the London, one of the most standard sequences is bishop d6, which is met with bishop g3. Now, of course, here, you're not trying to take with the f-pawn. You're trying to take toward the center and open up the file. But it's the same principle, just translated to a different file in the game, in the sense that we play f takes g3 in order to open up access to the f7 square. Then we chased the bishop away. There was one further detail in response to bishop d1, we had a really sexy move. Okay, it's it's straightforward, but it's reliant on a really cool tactic. Who can spot this straightforward but nice move? It's not d6. I would say this is premature because of rook c6. And why have you you've you've created an additional weakness? It's not rook d2. I don't want to move this rook away from the f file. Can we do it with the other rook? That's a hint. Can you do it with the other rook? Turns out that you can, rook to a1. And if you look carefully, you have now the move d6. That's it. Double attack on the rook and a discovered attack on the bishop. And of course, black can continue playing here, but this is dead lost. Black is up a full exchange. White is up a full exchange. So here I would have played rook a1. This is what I was hoping would happen. Not taking no for an answer. Now we play rook a4. We lift the rook up. I don't think my technique was ideal. If you look at this with an engine, you'll probably find that I made some inaccuracies, but I think it's a moot point. We never let the wind slip. We're up two pawns, and now we just expand a little bit on the king side. Patient play, g4. There's no hurry. Black has no plan. And now we decided to trade rooks. Note that after bishop d7, we would have forced a winning pawn endgame with rook to d8. This is actually a pretty important detail. You don't want a rook endgame because rook endgames tend to be very drawish. Rook d8 check. Uh, in response to king c7, you should not play d6 check. I think this is a move which would be very tempting to some people. But after king takes eight, you've just given away your pawn. And white is probably still winning after bishop f5, but why? Why is this necessary? Just give a check. And now you can even go b4 cb and c4 and this pawn decides the game or or you can start with c4 and then play b4 and c5 so plenty of ways to win king e5 h5 is is game over and i really like bishop g8 i think this is the last flourish avoiding blundering the bishop and black just has no way to stop d6 the rook is literally just trapped here that's it d6 and our opponent resigned because the rook is trapped so again the final like 10 15 moves were in time pressure and should be taken with a grain of salt. I don't think my endgame technique was perfect, but I think it was it was sufficient to win the game. So that was complicated. That was very a lot of meat on the bone there. Key takeaways from this game. What's the TLDR? First of all, in, in terms of the theory, queen a4 check is the best move against the uh, delayed d5 variation. Our biggest mistake was to play... Uh, so d4 here is a very good move. But after knight e5, it's crucial to take back with the bishop, secure the bishop pair, and enjoy your life in that endgame. Remember that knight a3 is a very typical move in the Alapin, and the knight b5 is not the only idea. You can drop the knight back to c2 and prepare d4. Then uh, one of the critical moments, well, of course, d4, uh, finding the opportunity to push the pawn, and bishop takes d5, being constantly on alert for tactics even in positions where they seem very unlikely and doing, you know, crossing your T's, dotting your I's, always considering captures, even if just for a single second. And once the pawn was won, oh, sorry, I keep doing that. Once the pawn was won, uh, I think the game-winning moves were d5 and bishop f4, both moves aimed at prophylaxis, stopping your opponent's threats, uh, positional and tactical. All right, guys, I think that concludes the presentation. That probably took over an hour. I put all of my effort into that explanation. Uh, but for now, everybody, thanks. Have a good one and 